Hello, everyone. My name is Julieta Valsnoyes, and I am the Deputy Director of the Foreign Service Institute at the US Department of State. Thank you all for joining us online today. September marks the one year anniversary of the Heroes of US Diplomacy Initiative. Over the past years, we have shared with you six distinct stories of historical and modern day heroes of US diplomacy, shedding light on the contributions made by past and present members of the Department of State's Foreign Service and Civil Service. In the near future, we will highlight efforts of locally employed staff at US embassies around the world. We are delighted to continue to share the stories of these heroes from our past and present, even during the pandemic. Today, we will honor the first Foreign Service officer to receive this designation. William Rowland showed dedication, quick thinking, adaptivity and physical courage, as well as calm decisiveness in challenging situations throughout his over two decade career with the US Department of State. But his most challenging assignment may very well have been his first. And today we honor him for the brave actions he took between June 5th to the 11th in 1997. At that time, William was an entry level officer working in the political and economic section at the US Embassy in Brazzaville. In this role, William followed national politics in the Republic of Congo, including elections. As he will soon tell you, those elections were preempted when political tensions boiled over into violence and civil war broke out. Caught in the crossfire between the two sides, William nevertheless ventured outside of his safe haven to save the lives of some of the very last American citizens in the city and to evacuate them to safety. He volunteered to go above and beyond his responsibilities, repeatedly risking his life to bring private US citizens, including Peace Corps volunteers, missionaries, foreign service personnel, and other embassy staff to safety during an outburst of violence in Brazzaville. He was caught in fighting between the Cobra militia and government troops multiple times over the course of a week, and he came in dangerous close contact with rebels in order to retrieve two colleagues who were being held hostage by the rebels. William's cultural diplomacy and language skills served him well as he convinced a Ukrainian salvage team traveling on an old Russian plane to give him and the remaining Americans a secure safe passage out of the war zone aboard their craft and across the river to Kinshasa. William's commitment to the safety of American citizens abroad and in the midst of a severe security threat at the US Embassy in Brazzaville, Congo that summer earned him the recognition as a hero of US diplomacy. I would like to thank the Una Chapman Cox Foundation for its generous support of the Heroes of US Diplomacy Initiative which highlights these stories of modern day heroes among us alongside heroes from our department's rich history. These heroes have displayed sound policy judgment as well as intellectual, moral, and physical courage while elevating US diplomacy. I wanna thank the trustees of the Cox Foundation for tuning into our program today. And I also want to welcome William's wife, Claudia, and his daughters, as well as his brothers, and the entire Garrido and Echeverri families for joining us today. In addition, I want to thank the Bureau of African Affairs and our colleagues there for partnering with us to bring William's fascinating story to life for today's live program. And with that, I'm delighted to welcome today's speakers, my colleagues, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Central Africa and Public Affairs, Elizabeth Fitzsimmons, who will be interviewing our honoree. And of course, most of all, I'm especially pleased to welcome today's honoree, Foreign Service Officer William Rowland, who recently retired from the department after a 25 year career with postings around the world. William showed us what an extraordinary impact one individual can make in the midst of a crisis. And now I'd like to turn it over to my colleagues, Deputy Assistant Secretary Fitzsimmons and William Rowland himself to hear more about his incredible story. We will leave 15 minutes at the end of the program for questions and answers, which you can submit via the YouTube chat box. 
with that, Elizabeth and William, over to you. Thanks so much, Ambassador Noyes. It's just wonderful to get to partner with the Foreign Service Institute. And William and your family, thank you so much for being here today. I really can't wait for you to share your story with us. I think for me, the true meaning of heroism is putting others first, even at your own peril. And your actions in Brazzaville in June of 1997 certainly meet and really exceed that definition. In fact, as our audience will hear shortly, you made the choice to be heroic more than once for many days in a row in truly incredible circumstances. On behalf of the Bureau of African Affairs, I'm delighted to be with you all today. I wanna set the scene for our audience for just a moment so they have a really clear picture of where we are in the world as your story unfolds. You were in Brazzaville, the capital of the Republic of the Congo on one side of the mighty Congo River with Kinshasa, the capital of what was then Zaire, modern day Democratic Republic of the Congo on the other side of the river. And these are in fact, with the exception of the Vatican and Rome, these are the two closest geographic capitals in the world. The two embassy teams have historically enjoyed close relationships, even meeting sometimes on sandbars at low tide in the river for picnics, a tradition that continues even now. And in fact, William, I think you had hosted the embassy Kinshasa team just three weeks before the events we're about to hear about in June of 1997, when they were evacuated, and that will tie into our story. So without further ado, William, can you please set the scene by telling us what was life like in Brazzaville in the spring of 1997 before the events for which you're being honored took place? Uh, life there beforehand was rather normal. Um, it was a nice uh, French colony, uh, good food, uh, pleasant company. Uh, we had Peace Corps volunteers all over the country. Uh, and we were doing the normal political economic uh, work of the time, especially working with the National Endowment for the Democracy on getting ready for elections that summer. And then can you tell our audience what changed? What happened in the early days of June 1997? Well, we were at work one day, probably about one o'clock in the afternoon, and um, we heard gunfire. And we talked to the local guard chief and we asked what was going on. He explained that the presidency had sent tanks to surround the House of the Opposition Leader, which is down the other end of the street from where the embassy was. Evidently, they had surrounded the House, but then when there was some gunfire, the tank crews deserted and they took over the tanks. And then all of a sudden, the tanks were faced back towards the palace and there was fighting going on. And as Ambassador Noyes mentioned, William, this was your first tour in the Foreign Service. Who else was there? with you in the embassy at the time? Uh, the basic members of the country team. We had the ambassador, the DCM. Uh, I was the political economic officer. We had a consular officer. Uh, we had a medical officer. Uh, RSO was out of country. We had a TDY uh, Department of Defense officer. A very small so a relatively office. small team. Yes. And was as this, the tanks are turned back and the gunfire has started, was there any thought of evacuating across the river? You had previously hosted your embassy Kinshasa colleagues when they had evacuated. Did you all think about getting into a boat and going across to uh, Zaire? Well, th that was the actual evacuation plan is we had a motorboat staged at a landing right in front of the embassy. And the idea was just to go to hop on the motorboat and steam straight across the river. Uh, when push came to shove, uh, it was a live fire zone. Uh, they were firing machine guns and other stuff right across the dock. And there's, we said, there's no way we can get out that way. Wow. So what happened next? You're, you're relatively pinned down. You're at the embassy. Your evacuation route is not available to you. What were the next few days like? Well, that night, uh, at least the area we were in, the government troops were still controlling us. So they let us go home, uh, pack my go away bag and took some final pictures and went to work the next day. Uh, early that afternoon, uh, the alarms went off in the building and they said the locals were trying to come over the walls. Uh, so they set off the tear gas and they evacuated us all to the safe haven. Tell us what that is like. What was it like in the safe haven? What were you thinking and what was the atmosphere with your colleagues? Well, it was fairly tense. I mean, the safe haven was on the third floor between the ambassador's office and the communications unit. Uh, we had various other people in the building, a few Peace Corps volunteers, as well as the local employees or the, the American employees. 
the Marines had all their ammunition behind post one. And so when the, the, the alarm got given, we formed a human chain going up the stairs. We passed all their ammunition up to the third floor in case we needed it. And so were you sleeping in the embassy at that point? We slept there for the next week. Um, we fairly shortly after that, the order got given to destroy everything in the embassy. So we lined up about seven shredders and just put everybody to work. 24 seven shredding all the documents that we could find in the embassy. Uh, during lulls and fighting, we would go down and grab more and bring them back. Uh, we were living up in the safe haven with MREs. Uh, for pillows, you could take the shredded paper and put them in mail bags and that works very well as a pillow. Wow, so you're all there, sheltering in place, shredding all the material for the embassy, sleeping on the shredded material, eating MREs. Were you frightened, William? I don't know that I really had time to be frightened. I mean, it was just everything was going on and you're so involved in the situation, you don't really think about it that way. Unbelievable. So what was the situation like outside the embassy on the ground? You're all in the embassy sheltering and going through all of the preparations in case you have to evacuate. Meanwhile, what was happening on the streets? Uh, it was a bit of chaos. I mean, the, the government troops and the opposition troops were fighting it out. Uh, at that point, the consular officer was working with the gunning sergeant uh, to identify where Americans were and make sure that they could get out of their areas and back to the airport to be able to get out of the country. And I know the information in your award nomination talks about a particular act of heroism. So I want to take us there now in the story. I would love it if you could talk to us about the experience of going to recover your colleagues and how it had how it came to be that they were held hostage by rebels and and your role in that part of the story. Well, sure. As I said, um, they, they were a couple cars out trying to rest to identify people who were trapped either behind enemy lines or in potentially bad areas and make sure they could get out. Uh, there was the consul and the gunning sergeant were in one car, the TDY Department of Affairs person was in the other car and they were going along. Uh, they went to an area where the rebel lines had crossed over fairly recently and all of a sudden they were trapped behind rebel lines. Uh, the rebels took an RPG and uh, machine gun fire to the one car, it disabled it. Uh, the defense attache person floored it and got out of there on their rims. Uh, the two that were left got taken hostage by the rebels. And the first we knew of it was when we got a phone call out of our radio network uh, from the rebel commander. All of a sudden a strange voice said, we've got your people come, said so do you get them? So the rebels had in fact commandeered the radio and were able to communicate directly with you at the embassy? That's what they were doing. And so yeah. the amb ambassador looked around and said, who can we send? And I said, I'll do it. And so he said, yes, and handed me the keys to the ambassador's limo. Uh, being one of the few bulletproof vehicles we had. And so I drove over, uh, you know, having been lived in there for almost two years, I had a good, decent knowledge of the city. And so I could drip, make it over to where they were. Uh, had to go through a number of roadblocks with soldiers who were drunk or otherwise out of not necessarily the most orderly people, uh, always worrying that just because their boss had told them to let me through, the, whether they would actually let me through. Uh, finally got over to where they were being held. Uh, they came out and the first words out of the consul's mouth was, I don't know why you're here. I thought we were gonna get out of here by ourselves. So William, take us back to that moment when the ambassador is looking around this small group trying to get a volunteer for this most perilous mission. Um, what was going through your mind and how did you make the decision to act in that moment? Well, I mean, there weren't a whole lot of us to start with. Um, and it just seemed the right thing to do. Uh, you know, he was looking for a volunteer and I said I could do it. And so I said I would do it. So you've got the keys to the ambassador's limo and you're driving through the city of Brazzaville. What's going through your mind on the drive? Uh, well, I was on the radio the entire time trying to relay back to the embassy what was happening, uh, you know, giving them you know, reports as I was going along. Um, I just figured I'd do my best to go where I was going to get and try to get back safe. Um, I'm not sure there was a whole lot really going through my mind at that point. 
So you were safely able to rescue your two colleagues. You put them in the limo, drive back to the embassy. Tell us what happens in the, the, the succeeding hours and, and days after that. Well, shortly after we got back to the embassy with my two colleagues, uh, the lines of fighting moved past the embassy and we were trapped behind there. Um, then the next point was a couple days later, uh, the, along with the Department of Defense, state arranged for a either four or six man military uh, group to come in and assist us. They were going to fly in on a C-135, land at the airport. Uh, it was also agreed that the empty plane could take back people who needed to be evacuated so we could get the Peace Corps volunteers and any other Americans out of there. Uh, so having worked at the airport before on the Zaire evacuation or a potential evacuation, uh, they sent me out there uh, to coordinate operations. So we loaded up. Yeah. Go ahead, William. Keep going. Went out to the airport. Uh, there was an ongoing firefight there, so we sheltered behind the vehicles while we could. Uh, the plane finally landed and we got the people off and we got the U.S. military to escort us back to the embassy. And how many Americans were evacuated on that first flight? I think it was about 30 people in total uh, between Peace Corps volunteers, uh, some eligible family members and some private citizens. And did you face fire as you made the trip to the airport or was that a relatively calm trip compared to your previous hostage rescue mission? It was relatively calm. I mean, there were a number of roadblocks. Um, even if they're government troops, they were ner nervous about what was going on. Uh, got out to the airport and what was amazing was the number of abandoned cars everywhere because uh, the air airport had been continuously operating during this entire time. And so anybody who wanted to leave could book a ticket, but they would take drive their car out and just dump it on the field as there's acres of cars everywhere around the airport. Amazing. So you've gotten the first group of Americans out, and I understand that there were still American citizens, missionaries, Peace Corps volunteers, and others that needed to be evacuated. So what was the second trip to the airport like? Can you tell us about the decisions around the evacuation? Well, actually, we've gotten the majority of people out by that time. Um, the next trip out to the airport was actual drawdown of embassy operations. Uh, we probably had 10 people and they decided to send about half of those people out of the country. Uh, it was a gradual drawdown before a final shutdown of the embassy. Uh, so we got sent out to the airport again. Uh, that trip, uh, we had the US military escorting us as well as the French Foreign Legion, which was very nice. Uh, we drove out to the airport, once again under fire. Uh, the, we were lying out there and one of the Marines said, you see, the sound of machine gun fire is different when it is coming at you as opposed to when it's going across in front of you. And I could see what he said. Um, we had gone out there with the idea that a missionary air flight was going to fly over from Kinshasa to pick us up. Uh, so that Is that what plan. happened? Well, no, because we got out to the airport and they called us over the radios and said the missionary air flight cannot come because their insurance company will not um, cover them if they actually go into a war zone. So we looked around to try to figure out what other options we had now that we were all out at the airport. And I saw an airplane out on the runway. It was an old like DC-7 from World War II. Uh, and we went up to the airplane. It turned out it was a Russian-Ukrainian crew. Uh, they had come over to pick up a 747 engine for one of their other aircrafts that had been trucked up from the coast and they didn't want to lose this half million dollar investment. And so I said to them in broken Russian, I'd taken a few years in, in university, um, you know, can you take us with you to Zaire? Um, and you know, they'll pay you when we get there. And so they agreed. And so here's the picture of us outside the embassy uh, with the French Foreign Legion getting ready to load up for the convoy. See the French flag there. Uh, this is the US military on the main road, uh, headed out to the airport. And I think, great, there we've got another photo. Uh, that's at the airport, the, the government troops dug into position. That and I think the that's the Russian plane. On. They are loading the uh, bags of communication gear onto the airplane because one of the things we do when we shut down embassy is we strip the embassy of all the communication gear. 
Okay, and I think the next photo, if we can go along, perfect. That so, is in the air for the roughly 10 to 15 minute flight from Brazil to Kinshasa. As you can see, there's the Congo River running through the middle of the picture. Uh, both sides look exactly the same. Uh, from the air, you can't tell what, which country you're in. So William, take us back to this moment. You're sitting on the plane taking this photograph. What is going through your mind after what you've been through in the previous five or six days? I'd say the biggest thing was a letdown. I mean, you'd been under virtually constant pressure for an entire week. A um, couple trips out under fire, work, trying to get through the rubble roadblocks, et cetera. And finally, we were on our way to some place that was stable, um, the Zaire, which is now under rebel government. <laughs> so you arrive in Zaire, and if we can go to the next photo. Arrived in Zaire, and in Zaire, the rebels hadn't really taken over the country completely yet. Uh, administrative functions still weren't working. They were soldiers at the airport. Uh, they, the, you can see the stamps there, the entry and exit stamps from Zaire say ANR Inter, uh, which was, I think, one of the companies which had previously been working there. And they just said, yep, you're admitted or you're not admitted. And so they let us in. And what happened next? Where did you stay? Well, lucky for me, uh, in the previous month when the personnel from Zaire had evacuated uh, before the rebels had taken over, uh, several of the embassy employees had come over and stayed at my place. And they had jokingly said, well, we'll see you in a few weeks when you have elections. And so I showed up and said, well, I'm here a little bit early, but I'm glad to take you up on your offer. And how long did you stay in Kinshasa? I was there for about three weeks before I actually got evacuated back to DC. And I think one of the things that will really be of interest to our audience before we go on to the next part of the story. So you had obviously to abandon your house. You were living in the embassy. What happened to your house and your possessions in Brazzaville? Well, I got out with a shoulder bag, you know, a pair of blue jeans, a couple of shirts and my camera. Uh, the rest of the stuff got left in the house. Uh, about a month later, evidently there, according to reports I received, uh, there had been Artillery launched from our side of the river, which had landed on the presidential compound on the other side of the river. Uh, the Zairians had been upset by that and decided to randomly launch shells back across the river. One of those hit my house. Uh, the local guard staff of it very courageously went in, put out the fire and salvaged what they could and took it to the embassy. Uh, then about another month later, the actual embassy got overrun by locals and completely stripped and everything got taken. So no memorabilia apart from these photos that you're, you're showing us. That's all I got out with in my life. <laughs> and really at this moment, I'd just like to remind our audience of the enormous courage of the locally engaged staff. I think there'll be a future FSI event to honor some of the heroes of diplomacy of our locally engaged staff. But the fact that at their own personal risk, they went to try to save some of your possessions, I think is just a wonderful testament to the close relationship between American employees and the locally engaged staff and to the true courage we see from our locally engaged colleagues. If any of you are watching, just know that you have our appreciation and deep gratitude. So William, here you are three weeks in Kinshasa and now you've come back to the States. Uh, how did you cope with the change in plans? Uh, well, I worked on the desk um, in terms of running uh, the, the desk for Brazzaville Congo, uh, for Libreville, for Sao Tome, uh, for about two months. And then I went into Spanish training. Um, it wasn't the easiest things to deal with. Uh, you've gone from a live fire zone and all of a sudden you were back in Washington, uh, either working in the department or in language training. Um, but over time it failed out and you can deal with it. Do you have any tips for our audience on the things that helped you be resilient and adjust to this enormous change in your life circumstances? I think flexibility was the big thing. Um, and very soon after it happened, I understood you, you can't count on everything being the same. Um, just because things are one way today doesn't mean they'll be that way tomorrow. So expect the unexpected um, and just roll with the punches. Um, do your best to take care of the most important things today and not wait, leave them for tomorrow because you may not have a chance to get around to them. Great advice and certainly so timely in 2020. 
Um, after your tour, William, in Brazzaville, that of course was your first tour of a 25 year career, you served 23 more years with the State Department. I'm wondering what motivated you to stay in the Foreign Service after the enormous challenges you faced in your first assignment? Well, I mean, I shortly became a consular officer, which is basically doing visas, uh, but also taking care of American citizen services, helping them out in troubles. Uh, and from my work in my first tour, I found it was a very rewarding thing to be able to help out Americans when they are in a situation where they can't help themselves. Um, so I think that was what motivated me to keep going. And William, how did the evacuation of Brazzaville shape your professional career and the subsequent assignment choices that you made? I'd say the biggest thing, it was, there, there was no assignment which I wasn't willing to take on. Uh, whether it was going to Venezuela, whether it was going to Haiti, um, I, there was no challenge which wasn't too, too much to take on. Well, you certainly have chosen some of the real challenges for your professional career. We've talked a lot about the challenging moments. Could you share with our audience some of your happiest moments at your overseas assignments? Well, I'd say by far the happiest moment I had on overseas uh, assignment was when I was in Colombia. I met my future wife and we actually got married there. Uh, had the fun of going to the Bishop of Bogota and requesting permission to get married in the Catholic Church as a special exception. Uh, uh, but anyway, that, that was my favorite moment in my foreign service career. Absolutely. That's another kind of heroism. And what a beautiful photo of you and your wife. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts also on mentors who've contributed to your career. What are the particular qualities or values that you've admired in your mentors? And any advice you have for your audience on what they should, our, our audience, on what they should look for when they're cultivating a mentoring relationship, either as the mentor or the mentee? Sure, well, I, I think my best mentor was somebody I met early in my career. He was one of my bosses then. Uh, we've kept contact over the years. Uh, he seemed generally interested in what I'm doing, uh, open to communications. Uh, I think the give and take is very important. Uh, and that's what I would suggest is if you're going to have a mentor, don't look for somebody just because of their title. You also have to have the personal relationship where you can actually depend on good feedback, uh, give and take relationships. Thanks for that. I think it's terrific advice. William, here we are in 2020, and there are so many in the Foreign Service and in other foreign affairs agencies, including yourself, who have faced curtailments or assignment changes in their plans to leave post because of the COVID pandemic. I'm wondering what advice you would have for folks facing a tour that looks different than what they planned when they originally took the assignment. As with any tour, uh, I think you got to just make the best you can of it. You know, look for what opportunities there are. Um, go back and look at your own personal skills and see whether you can bring anything that's not in the job description uh, to make it a better place to try to help move the mission forward. And thanks for that, William. What advice would you give our newest first tour officers, anyone embarking on their first assignment, particularly if they're going to a hardship or a high threat post, where they will face challenges, maybe not exactly the ones you faced, but certainly unlike things they've experienced before, what do you wish you could tell them or, or what advice would you give your younger self for succeeding and thriving in difficult environments? Um, you gotta be flexible, I think is the biggest thing. Uh, and just make the most of it. No matter how difficult the situations are, there is something you can find to focus on that will give you personal satisfaction and whether it's work or pleasure or anything else, but look for opportunities to make, to make yourself happy. Look for opportunities to make yourself happy. That's such a beautiful summation. And I think we have a current photo of your beautiful family. I'd love to close this portion with that. And William, give you any last words that you'd like to share about your career or the experience of heroism for which you're being honored today. Any last words for our audience? Uh, well, there's my wife, my daughter, uh, Elizabeth and Victoria and myself uh, at my daughter Elizabeth's graduation. Uh, that alone is makes the whole thing worthwhile. 
That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I'll turn it now back over to Ambassador Noyes, who will moderate a question and answer session for our audience. And William, I've gotten the pleasure of asking you and hearing from, from you so many exciting and interesting answers. I look forward to having our audience have the same opportunity to hear your story and ask you more questions about it. Thanks very much, Elizabeth. And, and William, thank you. My goodness, what a story you have just shared with us. Before I get started with the questions that we're receiving from the audience in the chat box, I did want to mention that uh, we will be having another one of these Heroes of Diplomacy events in November, watch your announcements, uh, to honor the achievements of our locally engaged staff who, as William so beautifully described, are frequently the ones who are also putting themselves in the face of danger in order to support US diplomacy. So, as we enjoy this event, we have another one to look forward to. So let me lead off with the very first question from the audience. William, as the days were going by when you were in this perilous situation and with so much happening around you, was your family back home aware of what was going on? Do you have any sense that they knew what kind of danger you were in? Did you have a chance to communicate with them? Tell us about your contacts with or, or the information that your family had about what was happening to you when you were when you were in Brazzaville? Well, sure. Um, on the first night when I had gone home, I had gotten out the brick of a cell phone and called my mother. And I said, no matter what you're seeing on CNN, we're all right. And she said, what are you talking about? Uh, this was 97 and international affairs weren't terribly well covered on it, on even CNN at that point in time. Uh, I said, whatever you hear, don't worry about it, but I'm okay. Um, but she hadn't heard a thing about it, so there it wasn't a terrible worry there at the point. Well, I can't, as a mom, I can't imagine that that's a very reassuring call to get from your child overseas, but um, how did she handle, or how did the rest of your ha family handle the information as more word got out about what was happening? Truthfully, I don't think word got really much got out. I mean, it was sort of a matter of, I had talked to my mother before as things were going down. And then I obviously got a hold of them when I got back to the States, but I don't think they'd heard anything much in the meantime. Wow. Well, times have changed, of course. And now our families do see and hear more about us when we're overseas. And I think this is a good opportunity to thank all of our family members who are who are looking out for us and thinking about us when we're far away overseas. Um, but so it's, it's just a, a chance to say thank you to them. Um, William, another question for you. Can you please tell us about other experiences that you had in your other assignments, other highlights from your career, other opportunities where you had a chance to, to show those qualities for which you are being honored here today? Uh, I, I'd say the experience which most directly relates was that after the earthquake in Haiti, uh, they contacted me. I was in India at that point in time, and they said, we understand you speak Creole, uh, which is the local language down there. And I said, yes. They said, well, we'd like you to go to, to Haiti to help out with the evacuation efforts. So I flew literally halfway around the world. It took close to a day to get there. Uh, ended up in San Domingo, where I got on a military Black Hawk helicopter and flown into Haiti and then proceeded to live under the desk in the concert section for the next two weeks, uh, working on getting people out of the Haiti after the earthquake. My goodness. Well, that's a good lead into another question from our audience. Considering the dangers that you have faced throughout your career, William, would you want to see one of your daughters join a career in the Foreign Service? I'd say yes. Um, I think on the whole, it's worth it. Um, any job is going to have dangers involved in it. Um, you know, it, it's dangerous even to be just here in the U.S. right now. Um, so if you take care, good care of yourself, um, State Department offers lots of training on how to deal with these situations nowadays, uh, training which I certainly didn't have, but they are offering now. Uh, so I think the, if I was talking about one of my daughters, they're, they won't give you a lot of preparation for dealing with these types of situations and the career is certainly worth it. Well, we look forward to seeing them at the Foreign Service Institute for training to join the State Department uh, after those inspiring words. So let me see, I'm reading the chat box and I'm looking at, at more questions from the audience. 
Um, the DCM in Brazzaville wrote, wrote to us that nowadays Brazzaville is one of the quietest places in Central Africa. So he wants to hear from you what the city was like before the war began. Oh, it was a fairly quiet place at that point in time. Um, when I was there, it was the first democratically elected government. Sasu and Gesu had been in power. Uh, they had held an election and even voted out. Uh, the, the French influence, you could feel it everywhere. Some of the best restaurants, even right across from the embassy for breakfast, were French baguettes and omelets, etc. cetera. Um, there was uh, decent nightlife for foreigners. Uh, the, down on the coast, uh, Port Noir was where the oil companies were headquartered, and there was a lot of stuff going on there with Americans and others. Um, it, it, it was a lively place. Great. Well, here's another question from our audience, William. Could you tell us what lessons you personally, as well as other members of the embassy community in Brazzaville, learned as a result of what happened during this very dramatic week that you have that you have shared with us? Hmm. Lessons. Uh, I basically you can't count on anything. Uh, we had been we spent three or four months with the National. Uh, Institute for Democracy, planning on how to hold the elections. Uh, there was all sorts of worries about would there be violence? Would people accept the election results? Uh, but then here we were a couple months before the elections and for unknown reasons, uh, there was a move against the opposition leader and they reacted to it. Um, you just never know what's gonna happen. Words of wisdom, I guess, for any of us in any circumstance. You never really know, so maybe seize the moment and enjoy the day. So William, um, tell us more about some of your other experiences in the Foreign Service. You certainly sound like you lived through some dramatic times in, in Haiti as well as Brazzaville. Can you share with us some other highlights or lessons that you've learned throughout your career? Highlights or lessons? Um... Well, I, I've been to many wonderful countries. Um, I think one of the best parts is to, to meet the local people as well as the local staff. Uh, the people who work on our embassies, uh, the locals are just wonderful people. Uh, they've dedicated their lives to serving the American government. Uh, and so it's, it's great to get to know them. Um, I mean, Brazil, there are a number of other countries I've been in and some of them are just absolutely beautiful. Um, most I can say. <laughs> okay, William, we have another question from our audience today asking if you could share um, the most important cultural diplomacy, cultural diplomacy lessons that you learned throughout your career. Um, tell us about your thoughts on the importance of learning the language, the culture, the history, the literature of the countries where you're serving and how that um, may have enriched or helped. Sure. Uh, I, if you're not going to just be a tourist visiting the country, you actually have to make an effort to try to get to know the language, to get to know something about the people that you're dealing with. Um, whether you're a consular officer, whether you're a political officer, economic, you name it, uh, or a public diplomacy officer. All the different jobs require that you interact with the people who live there. And if you can't understand why they are making the decisions there, if, if you say something to them and they react in a strange, which to you is a strange way, you have to say, why are they reacting that way? Did I say it in a way that they didn't like, or am I not explaining myself well? Is it because of their culture that they're acting that way? Um, it's, it's, if, if you just drop a foreigner here in the US, they're not gonna, if, if they don't speak English, if they don't have an idea of what's going on, they're gonna have a very hard time communicating. And to be an effective communicator, you really need to do know, know what's going on. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. And I, I suspect Elizabeth Elizabeth is, is sharing that, that point of view. Um, William, one of the most dramatic parts of the story, even though you totally downplayed it in your very, very sort of matter of fact presentation was to me the um, the information that everything you owned, your entire household, everything was destroyed uh, during this outbreak of violence or or in the days following the violence. 
and you had to replace everything except for maybe that pair of jeans and a camera that you carried in your shoulder bag. Well, how did that make you feel? And how did you go about replacing everything? What was that like to sort of lose everything in one fell swoop and then have to make it up again later? I think one thing that made it a little easier is just such a random act, you know, that an artillery shell lands on your house and destroys stuff. Um, it's kind of hard to blame anybody for that, that happening. Um, one of the last things I had done before I left the house is I had run around with my camera and taken pictures of everything. Uh, and so therefore, there is a Foreign Claims Act uh, from the 1960s. And so the amount of money you can get for any individual item is based upon 1960 prices. Um, but I, I did put in a claim. <laughs> Boy, did you ever encounter anything like that at any of your other posts? Did you ever sort of have that kind of tragic, uh, tragic loss or, or, or I, other, a couple times thought other I was things that you had to deal now. with that were unexpected? That point, thankfully. <laughs> so when did you feel like you were getting close to it? It sounds like you've got another story up your sleeve. Well, I mean, in Colombia when I was there, um, Things got very problematic. At one point in time, we couldn't even leave the capital. Uh, when I was in Haiti, that was shortly before Aristide fell. Uh, when I was in Venezuela, that was when Chavez died and Maduro took over. Um, several of the times when I was in Venezuela, I thought we'd be evacuating any day. Well, William, you've certainly served in some real hot spots, which is a good, uh, a good reason to ask you the following question from one of our audience members. Were there any particular skill sets that you learned either in, in your training here at FSI or maybe in your university days that you found you kept going back to over and over and using over and over? Um, what particular hard skills or soft skills were most useful to you throughout your diplomatic career? Um, I think it's the combination of the, the ability to call on whatever is necessary for the situation. So it's not that you have seal A, B, or C. It's how to, to have that whole toolkit that you can go back and say, okay, I need C and A right now, or I just need B right now. Um, and so it's identifying what skills you've got and be able to go back and call on those to be able to take advantage of them. My apologies, I'm having a little bit of internet access issues. Uh, I hope the rest of the audience heard that answer better than I did. But um, let me ask you about uh, other assignments uh, and, other, and other positions in which you may have again used those very dramatic negotiating skills that you used to get the Ukrainian Russian pilots who were out there on the tarmac to fly you and your colleagues to safety in Kinshasa. Can you tell us about other opportunities when you've done dances? Um, other opportunities like that? <laughs> well, nothing that dramatic. Um, I'd say certainly when I was a political officer in Haiti, uh, many of those skills came in use when I was either talking to the government uh, politicians or the opposition politicians. Um, there were moments when there were plots against the government or feared plots against the government and trying to relate to them and indicating them that we would get the information back to the U.S. government and, and go from there. Thank you. So um, you've been answering a lot of questions and I see Elizabeth uh, sitting by patiently and I'm wondering, Elizabeth, would you like to jump in and tell us a bit, now you're working in African Affairs in the Bureau of African Affairs, kind of leading, leading the Bureau through circumstances in a lot of different countries. Would you like to share with us some questions of, or, or some, some points about what it's like to work in African Affairs now, the things that, that keep you busy? 
Sure. Thank you, Ambassador. I'd be delighted. Uh, I think the first maybe piece of advice that I'd like to give the members of the audience that are actually considering an assignment in the Bureau of African Affairs is absolutely do it. I have come to African Affairs relatively late in my career, and I have absolutely fallen in love with the range of issues that we get to work on and the real difference that you can make as an individual diplomat working on a country team, particularly in one of the countries of Central Africa, but it's true across the continent and Sub-Saharan Africa, whether you're interested in trade and economic relationships, whether you're interested in health diplomacy, and that's obviously an extremely hot topic at the moment, whether you're interested in the environment and um, issues of around fish and wildlife and conservation of the natural environment and flora and fauna, whether you're interested in peace and security and the issues of international, multinational peacekeeping, or um, simply direct relationships between the US military and a host country military, whatever it is, we have the opportunity to do it. And of course, for our management officer colleagues, we need strong embassy platforms in places where the infrastructure can be very challenging. Um, clearly, there have been a lot of changes, for instance, in the Republic of Congo since 1997, but that's still a place where we have some real significant infrastructure challenges. So I would encourage you, if you're a member of our audience and you're thinking, would I be fascinated by or productive in an assignment in the Bureau of African Affairs? Absolutely, the answer is yes. And whether you like big embassies, we have the huge Mission South Africa team, we have large teams in Kenya and Ethiopia, or whether you're interested in a small embassy experience of the sort that William described, maybe not exactly of the sort that William <laughs> described, but that small embassy team experience, you can also have that opportunity in the Bureau of African Affairs. So I would really encourage anyone in our audience who is interested in bidding to consider that. I think for the members of our audience who are not involved in the State Department directly as a profession, really should still think very much about what they know or don't know about Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, a little story, it's been fascinating for me. One of my youngest children, who's a senior in high school, is taking a course on African studies this year, which I promise I did not pressure him into. But one of his early assignments was to ask family members and friends for five words that they associated with Africa. And it was fascinating as we he compiled the responses which he shared with me, because I was curious to see everything from poverty to disease, to youth, to entrepreneurship, to innovation. And I think it really exemplifies the opportunities that are happening on the continent. Um, it's projected that the uh, population of Sub-Saharan Africa will double by 2050. So we're talking about over 2 billion people and more than 65% of them will be under the age of 20. So this is an incredible youth tsunami. And you can imagine that maybe the cure for cancer, maybe the next NBA star, maybe um, the newest social media platform is right now just an idea in the head of a young person someplace in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so I think the primary goal for the United States is to form the partnerships, the real true equal partnerships that will mean that that idea or that scientific advance can be brought to bear and benefit the people of Sub-Saharan Africa and the people of the United States. So as you can tell, I have a huge amount of enthusiasm about the topic <laughs> and I would just encourage our audience to really get involved and learn more, challenge your own assumptions about Central Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa and I think you'll be amazed what you learn. Thank you, Elizabeth, that's great. Your passion definitely shows. Um, while you were speaking, I think you must have you must have uh, created an impetus and excitement among, among our audience members. We did get another question from the audience, but before I give you that question, William, I wanted to mention that we have the participants in the current Diplomacy at High Threat Post, a course that we offer here at FSI, are watching here today. I think they're taking notes, William, copiously, learning from your example but we wanted to welcome them to, to, our, um, to our event today. And um, I wanted to now share, William, the question that we got, which was, how well did you feel like the Department of State and your colleagues supported you when you returned from that assignment and from those dramatic events that you laid out for us earlier? Uh, well, I'd say at that point in time, the state didn't have a whole lot of uh, structures in place to deal with these things. Um, 
came back uh, there. We were on evacuation status. And I think there was somebody from the family liaison office who said hello to mm -hmm. us once or twice. But pretty much you were on your own. Uh, find a place to live, find a job, uh, go on from there. Wow. Well, I'm happy to report that things have changed since then. And we do have a lot more structures and mechanisms and, and support for employees. And of course, we have a lot of employees who have been evacuated from their posts during the current pandemic. Uh, and I'm glad to, to note that there are far more supports, both uh, for schooling, for resilience, for housing, for allowances. And I think the department is doing a, a better job these days, having learned perhaps from, from the experience of you and others before you who, who didn't get that kind of support. But we certainly are, are very pleased at FSI to support um, resilience training and, and give, give a little bit more of a boost to, to our colleagues who are going through these circumstances because after all, many of us wind up going through those circumstances in connection with the diplomatic career. So William, um, we're starting to get to the end of our program and I wanted to, uh, before, I, before I ask you any more questions, wanted to just ask you if there's anything that you sort of thought, oops, I forgot to mention that. Anything you'd like to go back on and, and add to your narrative or add to the advice that you have for people watching here today? I'd say the only thing I'd like to add is that, you know, as we discussed a little bit before, um, these types of things can happen. Uh, you never know when they're going to happen. But the Foreign Service is a great career, and I don't think that anybody should say just because of this, I don't want to pursue it. Uh, that's something that, it could happen there, but the vast majority of not, people are never going to have to face something like this. Um, but you can certainly have a great and wonderful career. Well, you know, I've heard Ambassador um, Mark Grossman, a former Under Secretary of State and Director General of the Foreign Service, once told me that there's nothing, nothing that beats going into a workplace where the American flag is flying above it. And I think that there's a lot to be said for that and you certainly have exemplified that um, with all of your with all of your heroic undertakings and all of the tough assignments that you've taken on behalf of the American people and our nation. Elizabeth, let me um, let me go back to you and ask if you had any questions that you wanted to ask uh, William and that uh, that you suddenly thought, oh why did I ask him that? Wow, that's um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I think, William, I would wonder what you said to your wife. So you have been through this experience in Brazzaville. You go off to Colombia. You fall in love with your beautiful wife. But let's face it, you've just been through an experience where, you know, everything you own, save some blue jeans, your camera and a shoulder bag has been incinerated by an artillery shell. So I'm wondering how you pitched her on a career as your spouse in the Foreign Service, because for our eligible family members, um, this is a career where they are part of the team. And I'm wondering if she had any trepidation about joining you on this adventure. Um, well, I guess truthfully, full disclosure wasn't involved in that one. Um, <laughs> I don't think I really told her too much about what had gone on my first tour. <laughs> And I guess my follow-up then would be, as you went on to this series of other really challenging assignments, was there ever a moment when she turned to you and said, what have you gotten me into? Um, or you know, any particular stories you want to tell about the family and the Foreign Service? Um, the Foreign Service life is not always the easiest for families, that's for sure. Um, you know, she's a medical doctor by career. Um, so she's had to look for volunteer jobs all over the place, working with TB patients in Haiti or other things like that. Um, re the upper echelon Sarisa reconstructing face faces in Honduras. Um, so it, it takes a special kind of person to be, to be a spouse in those situations. Uh, the kids, uh, I never forget when I came home one year in uh, India and they said, dad, we've decided we're going to boarding school. Uh, we can't stand the British school system. So make it happen for us, uh, but yeah. And William, maybe you could tell our audience what's next for you, having lived this life of adventure all around the world in all these different places, 
One thing I wonder is, is there some place you're dying to visit that you didn't get to during your career? And then what are your plans for retirement? Because um, I understand you've recently retired from the Foreign Service. So I'm wondering what your next chapter looks like. Well, I mean, the second question is the easier question. Uh, right, right now, uh, during the summer months, we're spending them in Swans Island, Maine. It's off the coast near Mount Desert Island. Um, and then during the winter months, we'll go down to Columbia, where we've got a place, uh, visit my wife's family, et cetera. Um, so snowbirds of a different feather. Uh, other than <laughs> and that, those are the current plans. Um, right now, don't have any plans to continue working, so we'll figure out where we go from here. And is there any destination that's on your bucket list, as it were, that you didn't get to during your career that you want to add in this retirement phase of travel? Or are you just going to be in Maine and Colombia and the rest of the world can do its own thing? Oh, uh, well, I'd certainly like to repeat and go back to Brazil. There are so many places I didn't get to when I was there. Uh, other than that, I'd say Argentina or Mexico would be neat places to go, two places I didn't get to go. Fantastic. Ambassador Noyes, are there other questions from the audience or can I keep going? No, I think, I think unfortunately, Elizabeth, we are coming to the time that we need to draw to a close. I want to thank you, Elizabeth, for, for um, joining us and, and helping us run this program. William, thank you for your amazing, amazing story and for all of your years of service and, and the example that you have been to all of our colleagues. We. Uh, we honor you and, and we thank you. And we wanna th thank everyone for this fascinating discussion to everyone who tuned in for the event. I'd like to thank the Una Chapman Cox Foundation again for supporting this initiative. And I want to remind people who have an interest in learning more that for more information on the Heroes of US Diplomacy Initiative, as well as to view video from today's event, you can visit the State Department, state.gov website slash heroes of US diplomacy, and also follow with the hashtag heroes of US diplomacy on social media, Twitter, LinkedIn. We are spreading these stories widely to, to highlight more of the work of our heroes. Um, Elizabeth, thank you. William, congratulations. All the best on your retirement. And everyone else, please join us again in November when we do another one of these events to highlight the local employees of our staff. Have a great day, everyone.